It's recording. Um, welcome to the second day of the Jetscape Summer School 2021. Um, our speaker now will be uh, Sengyong Xian, who will tell us about an overview of Monte Carlo methods. Go okay, ahead, hello everybody, good morning. Um, so my task today is to talk about the Monte Carlo methods. Uh, I've, I've looked at the past two uh, Monte Carlo methods uh, lectures in the past two years, and uh, it, it was, it was, they were very good. Uh, so what I'm, and, and they're very, very good in, in, in the explaining the details of physics. So what I'm going to do today is actually try to, in a way, talk about, you know, uh, the methods, how to actually do Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo simulations in some detail. If you have any questions, just ask, just ask in the Slack channel or just raise your hand um, and then the um, convener will um, convey that to me. Okay, so the plan is simple. I'll introduce the Monte Carlo methods and uh, again, the focus is uh, what, you, what you actually do in simulations. It does not advance anymore, but... Okay. Okay, so what is a Monte Carlo method? Well, some classes of mathematical problems, you, you can formulate it, but you can't really solve it analytically. A good example is, um, let's say, 10 dimensional, the 10 dimensional integral. Right? I mean, if you're lucky, it's just a bunch of polynomials, you can actually do it, but a lot of times it's complicated, you don't know how to do it. Uh, you, can also, you can always fire up your computer. But uh, trying to do some 10 dimensional integrals just using ordinary, uh, the discrete, discrete, discrete type, ordinary methods of uh, the something like a Monte Carlo, uh, sorry, the Newton codes or Lysander um, the methods, it'll take a long time. And if, especially if you have to do a lot of them, it's just, not, it's just not feasible. So in that case, what you want to do is you want to take it as, you want to take the problem as. Uh, statistical uh, problem, statistics problem, and in a way try to infer the value of that integral, for instance, in a statistical sense, okay? Also, a lot of physics is, is stochastic. In, in, a good example is Brownian motion, right? You, 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 uh, you put a fleck of dust in, a, in the water and see how it moves, it moves randomly because it's colliding with water molecules. So that sort of thing, you cannot really uh, formulate it in terms of a uh, smooth deterministic uh, fashion. Okay. Also, we know that quantum, pro quantum processes are inherently probabilistic. The Schrodinger equation I wrote down here, this is of course um, deterministic. However, when you interpret that in, 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 in terms of actual particles, it becomes probabilistic. The wave function just gives you probability density find the particle at certain time and space, but when you actually measure the position of that, part, this, this, that particle, what you have is just one position. Now, if you do many, 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 many such a measurement, the, the, the pattern will follow this probability distribution. But you, when you're measuring just that one time, you don't know where the particle will be, you just know the probability density. So it's all probabilistic. In that case, uh, you have to do, to, to, to study that sort of thing theoretically, you have to do Monte Carlo meaning that you use random numbers to actually infer some physics from a given theory. Okay, so why, are, why is our field interested in Monte Carlo method? Again, in general inter interest is something like a multidimensional integrals. A good example is a lattice QCD. Let's see, lattice QCD try to, it is what, what lattice QCD is trying to do is trying to evaluate this expression. This is the Euclidean path integral of quark and anti-quarks and gluon field weighted by the Euclidean like QCD Lagrangian. And if you want to measure something, the, you have to put an observable, operator for an observable here. Okay, you, okay so what's an, what's an path integral? It's basically infinite dimensional integral. Uh, as such, you cannot evaluate it explicitly. Even if you put it on a computer, you cannot, you cannot uh, the, uh, evaluate this explicitly. You have, to, you have to, in a way, treat this as a sampling problem. So basically you, you're treating this as your, this exponential as your probability density and sample the field values. Of course, there are many things that goes into it, how to do with fermions and fermion determinants, so determinants and all that, but it's basically the same problem. You have infinite dimensional integral, how do I study it? 
the only way to do it is Monte Carlo. Okay. It, the specific interest in this, in, in our case, is actually event generators. The, this is just a chess cape, uh, the, the, the um, summer school. So what we did, what we tried to deal with is event generators. We want to have event generators that actually generate events, the heavy ion collision event that resembles, that has enough physics in it so that we can study uh, what's going on inside actual system, theoretical, theoretically, and also exp uh, theoretically, and all to compare that with the experimental, experimental results and learn something about the underlying system. Okay. The basic idea is simple. You just follow Feynman diagrams like this. Oh, here's a quark, here's a quark merging with a, with a gluon become, becomes a offshell, offshell quark. Uh, it, it, it radiates another gluon, becomes on shell, collides with another, another quark going through and so on and so forth following the time. Idea is simple, of course, but the reality is not, not so simple. To, to do something like to do something like that, you re, you require uh, it, it requires a judicious mixture of quantum and classical concepts. Uh, but you know, good a good approximation can be obtained in many cases. And that's what we want to study. Okay. So in this in in this talk in this uh, lecture, I'm gonna talk about three things. I wanna I'm, I'm going to talk about how to do initial states. So something like this. You know how how do you actually get this nuclear nuclear positions? Uh, and then, the, then how, how to think about the evolution equations in terms of Monte Carlo method, and also then, and then hadronization and particularization. Okay, so this, so this is a nuclear uh, initial state, evolution, and then hadronization. Okay. Oh, the, the, some nomen, nomenclature. Hadronization is, is, the word hadronization is used in, this, in our context. Whenever quark and end, quarks and gluons actually make hadrons, either pulling string, clustering, something like that. The word particleization is used in our field uh, when you want to make particles out of uh, QGP, for instance, okay. in some statistical sense. Okay, so uh, let me briefly explain what, uh, what, what kind of MC, the Monte Carlo methods are used in jet simulation before we go into any details. So first of all, what is a jet? A jet is a phenomenon where a lot of a lot of finite state energy is concentrated in a small cone around the, around the common axis, like this. You have a, you have two hadrons colliding. You have a quark here, quark from here, another quark from here, uh, carrying a lot of energy of the original hadron collides. It, uh, it it collides and scatters at large angles, and these quarks eventually make uh, make hadrons. But because of this momentum in this direction, strong momentum in this direction. Most of, most of hadrons that are made will share that momentum and share the same axis. So, it, so this becomes a cone, cone of a hadronic shower. And that's what we call uh, the, the jets. Okay. And this is what we want to study because uh, these are really good probe of uh, underlying, uh, underlying the medium when, when, they, when they are created and interact with the underlying medium. So if you, if the, to study this theoretically, usually you draw diagrams like this. This is very schematic. This is not even a Feynman diagram. Okay. You have a, you have a quark, you, you, you have a quarks, anti-quarks and gluons in, in <coughs> incoming hadrons. Two of them will collide. And this is a hard process, meaning that they carry a lot of energy and scatter at large angle and they make jets and the remnant becomes underlying event hadrons. Okay. The, as you know, QCD is good only for had or only sorry you can do some some good calculations only in perturbative perturbative sense, okay. meaning that the, the only the hard scattering part this part can be calculated perturbatively. All others are or soft scale physics. This is good and bad. The the good bad thing is that okay you know this we know how to calculate this we don't really know how to actually calculate this we know how to evolve them but we don't know how to calculate calculate soft scale physics uh, from scratch. Okay. But the good news is because of this scale separation, you have soft physics happen, or happening here, hard physics happening here, and then another soft physics hap happening here, you can actually separate them. You can actually separate these, these, uh, these processes into a factorized part. And that leads to factorization. And that's good for us because when you, when you have this factorized form of uh, the uh, scattering process, and you can actually sample each part. Okay, so this is a usual the um, hadronization formula. This is called a parton distribution function. 
this means that uh, from, from hadron A, so this, sorry, this, this is a parton species A from hadron, in, inside hadron A. This is parton species B inside, inside, inside hadron B, okay? And, they, and, and then you sample the energy fraction of this, this, um, this, this parton and energy fraction of this parton, okay, called X, Xa and Xb, and you let them collide and make another parton species C and D at certain scales. And then these C and D now will become hadrons. And then that process is uh, described by this, uh, the, the fragmentation function. So this is QCD hard scattering cross section. These are parton distribution functions, and this is fragmentation function. And the reason we can actually write this in, in separately is because of, because of scale, scale separation and, uh, and scale separation. Otherwise, this will be all just in one function which is hard to uh, study, okay. But this is perfect. This, each, all of these functions can be sampled and that, that's perfect for a Monte Carlo method. So we'll treat this as a, as a probability density. This, uh, we'll treat this as probability density. We'll treat this as a probability density to get C and D. We'll treat this as a probability density that, that gives you a hadron species C, big C from the, uh, uh, the quarks, the proton species small c with the, the energy fraction of z out of this out of this um, proton small c. Okay. In in heavy ion collisions, of course, it's not. There's one more co complication. When the jet is created, it's not. It's not going to just uh, become hadronized. It has to go through Cochrane plasma. Uh, the it represented here with here as a, a red big red blob. So as the, as the energetic proton go through quarkum plasma, it's gonna interact with it. It'll lose energy, it'll change directions, it'll, it'll, it'll radiate more particles, it'll actually drag along the QZP fluid and so on and so forth. Okay, now the factorization theorem for this, uh, this sort of process is not yet proven uh, strictly. Okay, so this is, so the, the writing down something like this is that it's a phenomenological. What, what simply put, the, the Blue parts are just, uh, o, o, just from o, uh, original factorization theorem from uh, hadronic physics. Between the, create, between the creation of uh, the, the uh, scattered part on C and D and the uh, hadronization, we, put, we insert a, something like a, a the uh, jet quenching module. That's the idea. Okay. And this we can also do Mon uh, use Monte Carlo method to actually uh, propagate the high-energy high energy parton inside quarkum plasma. Okay. So again, this is phenomenological model. It has been very successful. Okay. So we, we know that a, a, a good amount of physics is contained in, in this method, but uh, the strictly speaking, it's not yet proven, but I know some people are still working on it. Okay, before we move, uh, move into uh, some details, here are some caveats. Okay. Monte Carlo method uses random number generations. Okay, so it's, uh, it works best for the systems with a memoryless evolution, meaning that the, what's happening now depends on very small amount of past. The current, the, 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 it, it only depends on the, the current, uh, the situation of the, of the particle and the system. Okay, and maybe one, maybe the, maybe something like one step uh, the, system, the state of the system one step below, one step behind, or something like that. But if you if you have to stretch it out to long time tail, long memory tail, then this is not suitable. Okay. Uh, the same same goes with this strong correlation because random numbers are not correlated. So if you if you want to deal with strongly correlated system, you have to devise something else. Okay. So what what does that mean in terms of quantum mechanics? In terms of quantum mechanics, this means that. The interactions are few and far, far between. Okay, so in in practice, what that means is that the mean free pass between each collision or each each, each uh, interactions is much longer than coherence lengths of of uh, those partons and particles. Okay, coherence length is you can you can think of coherence coherence length something like a uh, something like this when you when you collide two partons they will. And, and make a, a final state partons. In the beginning, they're too close to be, to be recognized as two, two separate partons. 
Okay. Only after some time, their, their wave functions will, will not overlap, um, will not overlap, and then you can call them two separate, two separate particles. Uh, if you have a large angle scattering, this is almost instantaneous. If you have a collinear radiation, for instance, this is not, not um, the, the, uh, the instantaneous. You have, to have a, you, have to, you have to give the mother and daughter pair enough time to, so that they can actually separate and be called, um, be regarded as uh, separate particles. And that's what coherence and length is all about. Okay. So in heavy ion collisions, uh, to do Monte Carlo simulation, what we need is what we need is that is that the, the mean free path is longer than coherence length. Okay, this is not always the case. Then you will have to you have to devise some some other met, some other methods or some slight, slightly uh, different uh, the uh, formulation of the problem. Okay, uh, one difficulty is again uh, the theoretically the rates you can calculate you calculate it using Feynman diagrams. But, it, but if, you, if you look at closely how you calculate Feynman diagrams, you use Fourier, Fourier transformation, meaning that you're, dealing with, you're purely dealing with energy, frequency, and momentum. Okay. That means the original X and T formulation has been changed to omega and K formulation. That means you have done Fourier transform. That means you have integrated from minus infinity in time and space. So, but in reality, in between collisions, there is no infinite amount of time or space that has elapsed. So there is always uncert some uncertainty, some, some ambiguity in, uh, in how to actually use Feynman, the rates calculated by, with Feynman diagrams. But again, you need this limit to actually make, to actually regard Feynman diagram, the rates calculated using Feynman diagrams as a good, as an applicable good rate, okay? So dense and strong interacting systems are difficult to simulate with the Monte Carlo method, but not, is, but not all is lost. Sometimes effectively sparse description is possible, like uh, quasi-particles, okay, but that's for later. Okay, uh, again, because the same reason, uh, reasons, interference effects such as LPA effect, again, coherence, coherent length effect, coherence effect and formation time, uh, they're difficult, in, 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 at first glance, they're difficult to deal with, but there are ways to deal with them. Okay, approximately at least. Okay, so, but you can also ask, okay, is it really necessary to include all physics in your simulations? The answer is no. Okay, you, 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 you just have to have enough physics uh, appropriate for the scale that you're looking at, both in time, both in space time and also energy and momentum. Okay, so let's, let's, uh, let's look at some details of uh, what we actually do when we do Monte Carlo simulation. So the first problem I want to deal with is turning this sort of uh, the, the density profile of a nucleus. This is, this is supposed to be something like a lead or, or uh, uh, the, the uh, gold, <clears throat> about approximately 200 nucleons. I want to turn this measurement or calculation, whatever, whatever you want to call it, into actual distribution of uh, nucleons. Okay, so the question is, how do I sample this? How do I sample this sort of uh, arbitrary the shape of, uh, of a density functions or, or probability density function into, uh, so sample it so that I can actually have this sort of uh, positions, nuclear positions. Okay, first of all, you have to ask why. Can I actually do this? Why is it okay? Why is it okay to treat measured density which is not even a nuclear density. The, what, what's measured is actually charge density. Because usually how you, how you measure the nuclear density is you, you scatter uh, electrons off of a nucleus and measure the, 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 the pattern of the scatter, scatter the electron and infer the density, okay? Um, so it's measured, measured that the density is not even nuclear density. So how do I actually, what's the justification that I, that I can actually use that to find the uh, positions of nucleons inside nucleus? Well, in quantum mechanics, uh, it says that, okay, if I have a wave function squared, I can treat that as probability density. And if I sample this probability density, that perfectly represent the particle, the, the position of the particles. But this is only for single particle quantum mechanics. If you have a many body quantum mechanics, that's not true. If you, have a, if you have many body wave function of the A number of uh, nucleons, the, the actual 
quantum mechanics, the quantum mechanics actually tells you is that what's, what governs their positions and pro the position, um, the position is actually the many body wave function, okay? And what that gives you is a many body probability density, this, not, not this, not, not the density, okay? So the strict answer is no, you can't do this, but the approximate answer is that, well, but we know that if, if you sample PA, this and the overall shape will follow uh, the density anyway. Okay, I have, uh, I have some questions. Uh, at a given scale, is it important to take all physics process and consider uh, it's moving too fast? If not, how do we decide which ones are important? Is it based on potential? What are the factors? Okay, so at a given scale, uh, uh, the, there are easy answers and the hard answers. Easy answers that you usually know. Okay, for instance, if you have a, if you have a temperature of 500 MeV, right, that gives you scale. Then you, you know that, okay, that the, I need to include any, everything, anything that, that happens around that, that energy scale. If you convert that into the uh, length scale, that's around 0.1 Fermi scale. So you know that, okay, I need to include uh, that's the physics in that physics of that scale. That's an easy answer to give. A uh, hard answer, however, is that uh, the, after you've done that, after you've done all the obvious thing, there are still, there could still be some things that you haven't thought about, especially because uh, the all, not all physics is perturbative. Uh, for that sort of thing, you really, you really need to, um, you really need to have an experience. A lot of a lot of intuitions actually come. A lot of intuitions come from running many many simulations, and trying to figure out. Oh, why did I why did I miss that feature? What physics am I missing? And just trying to figure it out. Okay. okay. Uh, e as okay okay Lauren okay. Okay. Okay, so why are we allowed to sample this? Okay, so nuclear density is actually uh, this sort of thing. You, you, have, you, have, you have a many body wave function. You actually, you see where you can find any particle at, at, at position X and you call that integrate over and you call that your nuclear density. Properly normalize that to A, okay. Uh, so why are we actually allowed to sample this? Well, it's because uh, the nucleus is rather, rather densely packed system. And they're roughly organized according, organized according to orbits. It's something like atomic orbits, but in this case, nuclear orbits. Okay. So if you avoid putting two nucleons too close together, okay, and we just, uh, we just uh, respect overall shape, we should be okay. Okay, this, of course, this is a very, very approximate answer. And you have to really um, do some simulations uh, to actually the, uh, have some confidence that this is, uh, this is this is okay thing to do. The confidence actually comes from some uh, low energy simulations. Okay, so in low energy simulations, what you can do is you can actually have uh, something called mean field calculations. So you actually mark up uh, the nuclear nuclear interactions with a field of rho, field of omega, and all the things like that. And you can then then you can actually make up a, you can actually assemble a, a certain number of nuclear nucleons and and have a nucleus. Okay, and if you if you don't have a good initial uh, the uh, initial positions of nucleons, you will actually see that your your nuclear your your nucleus will not hold. Eventually, it'll just scatter apart. Only if you do it right, then your nucleus will actually hold together, and stay as as one entity. Okay, so we have some we have some confidence that actually sampling this in a right way can actually give you a, a good snapshot of a nuclear positions in any nucleus. Of course, again, um, the, what I'm doing here is very rough um, details, uh, details later. I mean, det you, you details can, um, you can study later. Okay, so let's, let's do it. Okay, so the, the basic formula is this, okay? We treat this as a probability, probability density that has to be normalized to one, meaning that I have to divide by one, one over, divide by A. And if I write this in spherical coordinates, I have phi, azimuthal angle and polar angle, 
and I have the radius. Okay, so question is how do I sample phi? How do I sample theta? How do I sample r? Okay, uh, one simple fact. Okay, uh, the, the random number generator that you have in your in your let's say NumPy or something like that. The basic no, random number generator is all flat random number generator, meaning that the number, the random numbers are uniformly distributed within, within zero and one, okay? So that can be summarized in this statement, okay? If you, uh, if you have a random number, if you have a flat, sorry, if you have flat uh, uh, probability, probability distribution, that means uh, this is one. So if integral, integral from zero to certain x, then that just means that you have you, you, you have a constant to integrate and that just becomes x. Okay. So if you have uniform distribution, the normalization integral looks like this. You have, you have constant to integrate. Okay, that's the that's the giveaway that this your your uniform your probability distribution uniform distribution. Okay. Now if you have a general uh, the the probability density, you can also think about it integrating from the, the x minimum to certain x up to x maximum okay that suppose i know how to do this integral i call that function q okay but that can be also represented this way okay i can just take a derivative of a q in terms of x and the integral of x that's the same thing okay so what it means is that the integral of p any uniform dis any probability distribution is actually uniformly distributed. Okay, this is the basic basic idea. Okay, any integral of a general probability distribution is uniformly distributed. So if I know what this is, if I, if I, if, I, if I know how to do this integral, okay, I know that this is uniformly distributed. Therefore, to get x, all I have to do is take the inverse function. I generate random, ran, uniform random, random numbers uh, from zero to one that's, that represent Q. And I apply inverse function of Q and that's it. That's how you get X. Of course, the caveat is, is that you need to know how to, how to do this integral and you need to know how to invert that integral. For phi and theta, that's easy. Phi is already the, the uh, there's nothing here. It, it's constant. So phi is already randomly, uh, uniformly distributed. All you have to do is generate random number between, between zero, and, zero and one, multiply by two pi, that's it. That represents your z, that, sorry, that phi. Theta is a little more complicated because it's sine theta, but we know how to do integral of theta, which is cosine, and we know how to invert that. In this case, we don't even need to invert that because what you, what you normally need is just cosine theta because, because you, you, you're using uh, the, the uh, spherical coordinate system. Okay, so this is when, so the integral is randomly generated. What that means is that is the, the cosine theta is uniformly distributed between minus one and one. Okay, so all you have to do is just uh, to generate random between zero and one, scale it according, uh, 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 appropriately so that you can actually have a, a random number between minus one and one, and you call that cosine theta. Sine theta can be calculated, calculated using square root of one minus cosine, cosine cosine theta squared, that's it, okay. So sampling phi and theta is simple. Okay, so- uh, uh, Sang Yong? Yes. I there is a question in, yes. in the Slack. Right, is it really easier to take inverse of Q that is more, more complicated? The answer is no, <laughs> it's not easier. Sometimes, a lot of times it's just impossible. So we have to devise something else. And that's what I'm going to talk about actually. Okay, a, a really nice segue. Okay, so here, this is, this is the meat of the meat of the problem. We have to do this. We have to actually uh, the uh, generate random number according to this sort of distribution. I scaled it using, uh, uh, using the, the, the width parameter of uh, the, 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 the wood section so that I can deal with, I, I, so, I, so I can just deal with the, the uh, dimensionless quantities. Okay, so I'm just, call, just going to call them X and XA. Okay, so again, we need to do this uh, analytically. We need the integral of this and the inverse of that integral. The integral of this expression is known, but it's not really in, in, invertible. 
Okay, so how do I do that? How do I actually do generate random number? Well, the first uh, solution is just the bullet force solution. Okay, so the, here is the here is a form of um, of that the wood section x square times wood section distribution. Okay, here we go. That's the form, and the x x a I set it to seven. Okay, I can enclose it in a in a square. Sorry, in, in a rectangle, and just and just spray random numbers just uh, inside this uh, this rectangle. Uniformly to uniformly cover this rectangle, and I just then I can just take whatever is whatever falls under the curve. Okay, just disregard, discard all these uh, green green points, and just take the, the purple points. Okay, that'll give you the uh, the random the random numbers according to this curve. Okay, okay, this is you can always do this, but a lot of time this is really uh, wasteful. Because you, in this case, for instance, what what falls under under the curve under the curve is only thirty five percent of all all the all the uh, points you generate. Okay, so wasting you wasting the two thirds of your your computing time by just uh, filling out all this uh, all all the space. So that's not good. So we need to find a better method. Okay, so the better method is called the, the envelope function method. Okay, so before. If, the, previously, what we did was we filled in all this 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 rectangle, this rectangle between this green line and the bottom the bottom axis. We filled in all this space with the random numbers. Okay, but what we want to find is find the three pieces that can that I can actually uh, the integrate and invert. For instance, uh, I know that the the x square is larger larger than the the original the probability density in the probability density and hooks very closely in the beginning of of the uh, the in, in the beginning uh, in, for small x so here, here it's almost perfect and then it starts to deviate for small x for large x i know that i can use something like this I, this particular form is chosen because it is integrable and you can actually find inverse function and that represented by this orange line. Okay. I can just use these two. I, I can just use these two and generate a random numbers according, according to the P1 up to here and the P, P3 up to you know, after that and just uh, do it that way. If you do it that way, what you're wasting is just this amount of it, this area, maybe 30%. Okay, you can do that. Or better, you can also cut it Cut it down to cut it cut it with the maximum height of your probability density. Okay, you have three portions. You have x square portion here, constant portion here, and then x times x plus two times exponential portion here. Okay, so you can generate random number for for this for this part. You can generate random number. You use x square easy to easy to uh, integrate. Just x cube easy to uh, make find the inverse. Just um, you know. Third cubic, third third cubic root over a cubic root over z, and so on and so forth. Okay, then you can actually do this. This is very very common method. Okay. So, to to gen, to sample general uh, the general function, uh, p general uh, PDF p, uh, PDF uh, probability distribution distribution function. PDF is used in two different ways. Part on distribution. Distribution function, also probability distribution function. Okay, uh, most of times it's not easy to easy to actually find integral integral and its inverse. In that case, in, you, what you do is you try to find a good envelope function. Failing that, you can always use a histogram envelope, envelope function. Okay, so um, the you you just you just divide your uh, the x x uh, x space into smaller pieces. Look at the function and find the maximum maximum in the interval and make that as a the the, um, the the histogram. Okay. Notice this tip here. However, this is this is because you know I I'm assuming that with within any one interval, the the function form is, the functional form is uh, monotonic. Unfortunately, in this interval, it is not. It actually changes. So you have to watch out for something like that. However, if you have a small enough uh, intervals, this sort of tip will be very small, and it, you, you can you can call it tolerable error. Okay, 
So in a pinch, if you it all else fails, you can actually do this. Okay. Um, at a given scale. Uh, uh, Oh, that was just a question being copied okay. over to the All Slack, right. so you don't have to answer. Okay. All right. Okay. So here is summary for the um, to to find the nucleon for the nuclear position nucleon positions in a in a nucleus. Okay. Um, you can find the azimuthal angle easily. Just I went just uh, the uh, flat distribution cosine is also flat uh, follows a flat distribution. Uh, R you have to draw from the this distribution are using resection method with an angular function. There's all, but there's also a twist. You don't want to put them, put two nucleons too close together because they have size. Okay, the a volume of a nucleon, one the volume of sorry, one nucleon the, on, on average occupies one over the dense nuclear dens the normal nuclear density of the volume. That's about six for me, six cubic for me. You can you can translate that into sort of sphere, and then that you can you can you can uh, see that. The, the radius hard sphere, the, if, you, if you take the nucleon as hard sphere, it, the radius cannot speed, it cannot exceed one Fermi. Usually you set the radius of nucleon to be something like 0.7 Fermi, okay? Now the question is how do I generate the distributions without actually making them overlap? That's a simple, you, you generate the first one, you try, you generate second one and see if they touch. If they touch, it's okay. If they overlap, that's not okay. You, risk, you discard the second one, generate set generate another one, and, and and until they 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 don't do not overlap, and you repeat that until uh, you get a a number of positions. Now sometimes you you will just not be able to succeed. After in that case, in a, abandon that 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 part. Uh, sorry, that event. Just throw it away and start again. Okay, finding finding the the two hundred eight positions is cheap. It's not that it's not a computing intensive. Okay, you can of course improve that. You can you can find a better approximation with section. You can also find uh, if you can calculate the, the separate distribution distribution functions for proton and neutron. That's also better. Okay, if you if you if you generalize this this method to uh, n dimensional the uh, probability distribution function, it becomes a bit prob uh, the uh, complicated. Best case scenario is that your n-dimensional probability density can be separated into n one-dimensional ones. That, that's simple. You just do one-dimensional sampling uh, for each one. Next best case is uh, find a good separable envel envelope function for each axis. Okay. Uh, this can. This is not always. This I mean, sorry. This is always possible, but it may be not most efficient. Uh, bottom line: if you have n-dimensional uh, the the, uh, the random uh, probability distribution to sample, uh, sample uh, you have to think about it. There is no one method that actually works uh, well for all cases. Okay, let's talk about evolutions. Okay, I don't have much time. Okay, so I'll, I'll try to speed things up. So let's, let's talk about the next, next, uh, next step in any simulations like uh, ours, okay? So we find the, you find the initial condition, next thing to do is to propagate that. So the basic uh, the quantity to use in the, in the propagation of any particles is your cross section. Why is it useful? Because cross section is defined this way. It's a transition rate divided by flux. Okay. So what's a flux? It's, it's basically just uh, the, the uh, relative velocity between two colliding particles. That's, that's what flux is. Okay. So for any given collision, the flux is the same for any, any process that's going to happen when the two, two, two particles collide. So given the same flux, what sigma represents is actually a transition rate for each process. You can have, you, when you collide two particles, you can have elastic collisions, you can have uh, radiation, you can have inelastic collisions, inelastic collisions, you, have, you, you collide quark and anti-quark, make lots of hard hadron pions and pro uh, baryons and things like that. They're all different processes. And each, the cross section for each one represents in a way the partial, sorry, the partial probability, pro, sorry, probability for that process. So that's the basic, basic concept. We take cross section as a probability. Okay. So how do I turn that into simulation? Well, 
if you know the transition rate, you can do something like this. Okay, so give in a, within next time step for delta t, what's the probability for a particle with the property k turning into a particle with probability p? That's the basic, basic question in any simulation. So if I know the transition rate, answer is simple. That's just the, the transition rate times that small time step, because this is rate. So that's the pro main probability. Then you can ask questions. Okay, what's the average number of particles, such particles? Okay, that's, uh, it's uh, just probability times number of particles. That's it, right? So here's the probability for the, for the transition within delta t. Here is the particles, you know, number of particles with k you begin with. And, and uh, if they all, if, uh, okay, and okay, then what that means is that you will, at the end, you will have more number of particles in that has a property P, okay? So what this represents is gaining uh, the number of average particles that's gained by the energy momentum level P or the, 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 the uh, yeah, energy level P, okay? So you have this, this many particles with K, okay? And this is a probability for that particular K turning into P and you sum of all that, all k, and then you have uh, the total number of uh, the gains in the, in the energy level p. Loss is calculated the same way, but in this case, you start with p, okay? And those p turn into k, okay? And you can you sum of all the final states, and that's the number of particles that, that you lost out of uh, the energy level p, okay? So the basic concept, you start with, so how, well, how do you gain particles at, at P? Well, you start with something else and you make them P. How do you lose particles from P? Well, you start with the number of particles at P and make them something else, that's it, okay? And the total change is of course gain minus loss. But once you know this, you can now write down the rate equation. All you have to do is divide by delta T, make it, uh, make it, uh, make it small, go to infinitesimally small, uh, the, make it infinitesimally small and you get the rate equation. Okay, again, here's a graphical, graphical, uh, graphical representation of what's happening, right? So what, we have, what you've just shown is that if you have the rate equation, okay, you can unpack it. You can unpack it to get the rates and that's equivalent to the, the, what, what the, your process, this sort of process that's happening inside the system. Okay, that's it, that's the whole concept. You get the rate, you, you, know, you, you, you write down the rate equation, get the rate from the rate equation, use that to simulate your system, your, your evolution of system. For instance, here is a, the usual Amy McGill evolution equation. Okay, what does this represent? This represents the number of quarks at using uh, with the momentum longitudinal moment in this case, P. How do you gain that? You start with quark with P plus K, you get, and this is rate that P plus K becomes, P plus K emits in this case K, gluon, uh, the gluon with uh, the energy K. That means the remaining quark has a momentum P and that's the gain rate and so on and so forth. Okay, of course, the, these rates now all depends on local environment such as temperature and the, uh, the chemical potential. Okay, now this is what's usually being written down. Okay, so all you, all you, ha all you need to know, all you have to do is just to get the expression for these rates and then you can do simulation. Another uh, rate equation that we no normally follow is the Boltzmann equation. Okay, so here's the textbook expression of Boltzmann equation. Okay, so the task is we, we need to unpack this and get the rates. And how do you do that? Well, that's the rate, okay? So here is, so if, if, if I, the first term here is energy times partial derivative respect to T, okay? So what I need to do is divide this by the energy of P1. And that's what that is. Okay, and this and every and then and then you and then you you get and then you get rid of all these factors. Okay, and that's it. That's your that's your rate. Okay, so given your uh, Boltzmann equation, it's easy to get the rate. Of course, it's it's to write it down. The whether you can actually uh, the find the uh, formula for it is another question. Okay, 
Now, when, when in particular, when m is equal to two, and when you, when you have initial particle, initial, two initial state particles, then this whole thing turns into cross sections if you divide this by uh, the, the flux. Okay, so that's it. So the same thing. If you, either you get the rates from the expressions for the, let's say something like a rate equation or the cross section, you get the rate and you can do simulations. Okay, so what do you do? So you sample initial conditions to get the, um, the initial population particles. You, you propagate them using the rate. Okay, uh, you, first of all, you, you decide which two particles are going to, going to interact uh, using something like a total cross section. Once you decide that, okay, I have A and B colliding, then you look at partial the cross sections of each process that A and B can produce and then decide which process that, that, that is going to take place again using the random number generator according to those uh, the probabilities. And once you decide that, okay, I'm going to do, let's say elastically, okay, this A and B are going to undergo elastic collision then you look at the cross section, the cross section formula for the elastic collision, and then sample the final state energy and momentum from that uh, cross section. Okay. Then you move to the next event, next collision event. That's it. For unstable particles, you can do something similar with the total decay width and total decay, uh, partial decay width. All right. Um, I'm going to skip this because I'm running out of time. Okay, this, it's basically, basically rehashing the same, same thing. Okay, uh, there are examples, the Smash, LBT, Martini hybrid, and there are in, inside Jetscape, also RQMD, URQMD, Banff, Jam, Fini, all follow basically the same principle. Principle, of course, implementations vary widely between these, uh, implement, uh, these, these, these programs. Okay, I'm going to also skip this because uh, the Obviously, and also Reiner talked about this before in, in, the, in the last two years, and they, they did much better job that I can do in short amount of time. Basically, what, what it is, is that you write down the QCD scale evolution and, and realize, aha, this looks exactly the same as the time evolution. And, and the role of the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the transition rate is played by the splitting function. Okay, then you can use the splitting function as you as you at uh, the probably uh, sorry the transition rate uh, but in this case rate in the scale that's it that's that's the basic idea details of course you have to we have to look at the opposite and uh, Reiner's uh, presentation last last in the last two uh, session uh, last two years okay so some something something that's also good if you uh, if you something a good use for something like Monte Carlo simulation also is the gaining intuitions. Okay, so here is a small, small here are the small simulation that I made for some uh, pedagogical reasons. We also, we always talk about that uh, the almond shape of a carved out um, the, the collision volume generates V2. Okay, how do you visually see that? Well, what, what you, what you're gonna see next is that uh, they, the all, the all three simulations start with the same almond shape like this, okay? Then eventually it'll turn to that because of, v, because v, because of the V2, okay? If, or only if you have a collision. So if you, if you look at this, there's no collision. The shape remains the spherical, that there's no V2. Small cross section, V2 develops very slowly a large cross section, you can actually see that the, the elliptical shape actually turns uh, the other direction because, uh, because of pressure, basically. Or you also heard that a lot of times uh, the large cross section means small viscosity. It's intuitively that's not easy to grasp, but if you make a simulation like this, it's easy, it's easy to see. No collision, uh, small cross section, large cross section, you can see that original direction of red particles and blue particles are maintained, and also positions are basically maintained. So that gives you um, some intuitions about what's actually happening. Okay, hadronization. Okay, so next, next, next is hadronization uh, part. Okay, so I, I, I said that, okay, the fragmentation function can be sampled in the fact, from the factorization formula. That's, that's true, but the problem is that it, it gives you inclusive spectra only. Okay, because, because if you look at the factorization formula, you generate C and D, 
but only C is included in the formula. What about D? Well, you integrate over it. Okay, so that's not good because we want the full event. So uh, we, we, need to, we need to use something, something else that actually the, uh, reproduce the inc inclusive spectra given by this sort of fragmentation, measured fragmentation function, but actually gives you more fuller a picture of the evolution. And the, they are uh, the ones used in, in Jetscape are Loon string model and recombination model. Loon string model is, is um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it uses, <clears throat> it uses the idea that uh, the, when quark and anti-quark uh, scatters and separate, then they pull a string like this. Okay, this the, but if you stretch it too long, then energetically it's, it's favorable to actually have quark and anti-quark pair popping up. And that probability is, is, uh, is controlled by the tunneling property given by something like this, okay, Gaussian. And once you, so you, so you decide whether, whether to pop a quark QQR pair, once you do that using this probability, once you do that, you call this hadron. Now this is now hadron with the core content Q prime and Q bar, okay? And, and the, that, that determines what species you're gonna get. And of course, and that the, 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 in particular, but the particular species that you're gonna get is, another, is controlled by another probability. Okay, so this is, this is basic idea of Loon string model. Again, it's uh, basically sampling this probability and sampling this probability to actually get the, the, the uh, hadrons out of the strings. The combination model is a different idea. What, what, it, mean, what it means is that, uh, so what it does is that you actually, you, you start with a distribution of partons, okay? In phase space, quarks and gluons. And you ask uh, the partons, okay, who are the neighbors? Neighbors meaning in, in phase space, in phase space neighbor, neighbors in phase space, meaning that they have a similar position, not only similar position, but on also similar momentum, so that they're actually uh, moving together. Okay, um, at some point you decide that, okay, these guys are moving together, I'm just gonna form a meson. If you have three particles moving together, quarks, let's say, then you can form, form uh, the variant. Okay, so it formula, in formula, it's like this. Now, this is not really at Monte Carlo because once you, ha once you have a phase space uh, the distribution of uh, partons, okay, then this sort of thing is more or less deterministic because you, you're just asking, okay, who are your neighbors? There's nothing, nothing much random about it. Of course, there is some random element because you have to decide uh, if, if some of them are too close together, you have to decide which one is neighbor and which one is not, but um, it's basically deterministic. Okay, <clears throat> okay, a few minutes left. Another a common problem uh, in, in doing these simulations is, uh, is uh, okay, oh. simulation is uh, the um, sampling thermal distribution. Okay, something like this. Okay, how do you actually do that? You, you, do, you do this in, in JSK uh, when you want to have, uh, let's say, hydro, the uh, hydrodynamic background included in your jet simulation, meaning that you want particles from, soft particles from hydrodynam hydrodynamic background included in your particle list so that you can actually do cutting and things like that more or less as uh, the realistically. Okay, so in that case, the problem is that given a three volume delta V, Hyper hyperspace volume. How do you generate particles according to uh, thermal distribution? First of all, you need to know how many you need to generate. That that comes from the uh, the fact that if you have a Boltzmann distribution like this, the uh, the distribution number distribution follows a Poisson distribution. Okay, a discrete uh, the distribution. Then the problem is okay. How do I Knowing the average, now average uh, the number of particles that I can generate out of delta in, in delta v, how do I how do I, how do I determine which number? Well, Poisson distribution is a, is is a discrete um, probability uh, distribution. So what you do is you just you just lay them all in 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 a bar. You start with p1, p2, p3, and so on up to a certain maximum number. You generate a random number and see which box that that number falls into. That's it. If you generate random number and, and that random number value was inside, P, inside this second box, then you generate two particles. If, if the random number um, was in, in this box, you generate five particles and so on and so forth. Okay. 
Okay. Then you have, then of course, then you have to, you have to now, suppose you have five particles to generate and you have to sample this five times. Again, the idea is this idea is very similar to the uh, generating random numbers out of uh, the wood section uh, distribution. This part is exactly the same. This part is very similar. You still have, you also have P square and you have this sort of exponential uh, fall off at the, at the, uh, at large, um, at large P. The envelope function is again, very similar. X P square here, P square times exponential here. And then you cut it uh, with the maximum height. So your envelope function is like that. Okay, and you're only wasting this part here. Okay, this also works for forming direct distribution. Uh, the Bose-Einstein is a bit trickier because you have this minus sign, but the means is that uh, the, depending on the, the mass and the chemical potential, the small, small p behavior can be either p square, p or even constant. So it's not easy to make up a simple the, uh, envelope function. In a pinch, you can do a histogram. Okay. okay, so here is summary of the whole lecture. Okay, so the fundamental problem we face is basically quantum reality. The wave functions are fields, continuous fields that, 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 that spread in the whole space and time. But an event is, an, an event is made up of particles. So question is, you know, out of quantum field evolution, basically, how do you generate a bunch of particles? Okay, another problem is, of course, uh, many, body, many body dynamics is uh, often chaotic. It doesn't matter whether really the underlying dynamics is classical or quantum. If you have many body system, you know, even inevitably, your motion will look like chaotic motion. Okay. Uh, another, another, another fundamental problem for us is that it's much easier to calculate local properties than global and holistic properties. Okay, it's much easier to deal with in, inside your computer. So the idea for the, the whole idea of a Monte Carlo simulation is that with the local local information, okay, you string up all the local information so that you can actually um, the, you can actually think about the whole evolution of the system. That's the main idea of Monte Carlo simulations. Okay, if you, and and basically if you know the rates, you can do Monte Carlo of course. That's very simplistic idea, but uh, it's not true, not too far from the truth. Okay, if you know the rate, you can do Monte Carlo. Okay, uh, the problem, of course, is that not all the rates are known. For instance, you know, do you know do you know the scattering cross section of delta and sigma? I don't know. Okay, so that sort of thing has to be in a way guessed at. Okay, if if you if you if you're doing Hadronic cascade, there are many, many cross sections that you have no idea, you can, sorry, you do have an idea. You cannot measure, because you cannot have beam of delta, delta particle, delta variance, and beam of sigma variance, and collide them and measure the cross section. Okay. But you have, you, you, you do have a good idea uh, from, let's say, something like uh, the chiral, chiral field dynamics or uh, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, some approximate form of baryon baryon uh, cross sections. Then you can do Monte Carlo, but they, that also means that to do actually generate realistic uh, event, you do need to think about uh, the uh, some details. You need to you do need to model it with some with some parameters and details. Okay. Now, Jetscape is a really nice framework because a lot of these sort of uh, nitty, -gritty, nitty gritty details of what what happens inside your Monte Carlo gen generator is hidden. So if, if you if you say, if you just know let's say some rates let's say you know parton radiation gluon radiation radiation rate somehow you calculated it non perturbatively or you have a, some idea to actually improve the existing calculations you don't have to implement it you, you don't have to implement it at, at, at the let's say Pythia level all you have to do is just uh, make up a module okay, and then insert it and the test cape will actually take care of it all, all the nitty gritty details of course. If you want to generate your, if you want to make up your own Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo simulation, then you need all this. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sangyong. We have one minute officially for questions. <laughs> Sorry. So, okay. Sangyong, there's a there's a question for you in the Slack uh, okay. regarding the Lund uh, fragmentation.
Okay, so in rune string, the decision frame and one string or the other is random. Would it be better to use some parameter to say which string should be fragmented? Um, for each energy of string. Um, in inside Pythia, this doesn't really matter because there is no time evolution in Pythia. Okay, if it, once you have a string, they all just probably it, it's basically uh, they all you, it doesn't order doesn't matter inside matter. This might this might actually matter, but uh, obviously it is a better person to answer that question. Is recommendation model similar to a coalescence? Co recommendation model is coalescence model. Same, it's two, two names for the same thing. Any other questions? Doesn't seem so. And in, in the interest in keeping in time, uh, we'll cut off the questions at this point. And if you have any questions, there's a separate chat Slack channel for this uh, session. So you can you can type them in there and people can chat afterwards. Yeah. Let's thank Seng Young again thank you. for an excellent introduction. And I will stop the recording now. <laughs>